praise the Lord. Okay, I'd like to take us to uh, Acts, no, to Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. It was today's reading. I'm going to share a little different, and I hope by, by what I share with you, I've been meditating on this for numbers of years now, and it continues to become so, so real to me that it gives, it, it carries faith, the truth that allows me to receive what has been accomplished and see the, 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 the I don't think I see the totality, but I see so much more. And all this week I was meditating on that we have quoted in the New Testament in Acts chapter 3 and so forth, uh, that God would raise up a prophet like Moses, which we know is our Lord Jesus. And so today in our, in our daily reading, which is crazy how in many ways the Lord, just without planning it, keeps bringing me every day into an encounter in the Scripture just because we're reading on purpose together. And then it's something that's so important for a day like today. So Moses is speaking. The Lord has declared Moses to say these words. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. According to all you desired of the Lord, your God in Horeb, in the day of the assembly, which was when God came on the mountain and began to speak the Ten Commandments, he said, let you saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire anymore, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, what they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. So besides today being Memorial Day, dear Father, I pause to ask that you would, from your throne of Jesus, you would lead, send out Holy Spirit to speak declare all that the Father has that he's given, that is yours, that you are now want us to hear and to recognize and to embrace. And would you illuminate our understanding, the eyes of our understanding be enlightened so we can step into truth that has tremendous, uh, uh, tremendous opportunity of, the, of freedom and fullness and your kingdom being felt and seen in the earth today. In Jesus' name, amen. Besides this being Memorial Day weekend, besides today being Pentecost, in, in the Jewish world, on Friday uh, was celebrated Pentecost, Feast of the Weeks, or called Shavuot. And it was the day that's commemorated of the first covenant being enacted. Passover brought slaves out of Egypt. Pentecost, Feast of Weeks, brought the covenant, the Ten Commandments, and started the setting up of a nation. If not just the Ten Commandments, it set up a priesthood and a tabernacle, which were absolutely vital, and it took over about a year, less than, a little less than a year, to, to, to fashion it and put it in place. Uh, so there's a lot of correlation. And the reason is, Moses went up onto a mountain and received from God the Ten Commandments. And if you'll take me to uh, Exodus chapter 20. The Lord's ministered this to me a lot, and I know you know this to be true. The commandments have never changed. What's changed is, is the delivery system, the means to which God brings us into his likeness, his holiness, his his oneness. And I don't want to uh, labor on these commandments, but I do believe if we'll read them out loud, it will be, uh, uh, is that what Exodus 20? Let me see. Maybe I won't read it out loud if I don't want to read the, okay, I had it. I, 
Yeah. Okay, yeah, you're right. Yeah, we're right. We're going to stand up. Let's put ourselves as Israelis that are just freshly out of Egypt, not but a month, maybe just two months, less than two months, seven weeks. And we're now seeing fire burning on a mountain and hearing a voice like thunder speaking the Ten Commandments and therefore frightened after the encounter, thinking, I'm, I nev- I'm going to die. Stop. Just go tell us what to do, which started a whole different de- delivery system. But let's just read this together and let these words still sink in and let them be true. And we are all judged by them. Adultery is still adultery. Lying is still lying. Covetousness is still covetousness. Stealing is still stealing. Worshiping any other god is still the first commandment not to be. And it's just the whole improvement of the new covenant is vastly superior. And that's why it's, it's actually viable. The law would never work because the flesh and blood couldn't keep it. But let's just read it just again so the words fill the atmosphere. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Amen. You may be seated. Throughout the Jewish world, this is what they were doing on Friday. It's what to be re- reiterated. Now, I said that nothing's changed, and it absolutely hasn't. Uh, Jesus' first words in regard to hum- mankind on the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you, you've heard that it was written ago, long ago that you shall not murder. But I say to you that if any man hates his brother in his heart, he is guilty of murder. <coughs> Then he goes to the second commandment. First four deal with our relationship to God. The next six deal with our relationship to one another. And he says, you've heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, see, he he was changing it from something you could only measure on the outside to something that was obvious on the outside, but it always began from the heart and could be judged from the heart. He said, I say, if a man is to look at a woman with lust, he has already committed adultery with her. So, and this was 
the sermon, it, and it continues all of, so all the all the the standards not changed. The kingdom, the essence of who God is. This is who He is to partake of His nature. But it was impossible through this delivery system of the law to ever be a partaker of the divine nature because with the law comes wrath. With the law comes the knowledge of sin. With the law, it strengthens the sin and creates this whole chaos. So you, by the time Jesus is walking on the earth, you have the most dedicated group of Pharisees that are endeavoring to keep all the law. There are 10 commandments and 613 statutes that, that enlarge what the Ten Commandments, in essence, were about. And they were, the, the Pharisees were getting so caught up on the jots and the tittles and the traditions that they were, they were missing the point of what God came to do, because God is love, and he came to lift humanity up, and he came to create a place where, where, where life flowed freely and, and people were safe in the freedom of, its, of, of community and nation and identity. So Moses receives the tabernacle, its directive, and he receives the priestly ministry. Now, so let's fast forward. Jesus now comes in perfect submission to the Father, the prophet. God the Son becomes Son of Man. He empties himself of all privilege, all, all honor, all capacity to do anything as God and became holy man. When he walked in obedience with the Father... He came to the place that the Father said, now that you are my sinless offering, I need you to submit to me to death. I'm going to move from Father to judge. I'm going to judge you for the sin of humanity. I'm going to put all the sin of man on you. And you will become, and all of the impact of sin, it's sickness, it's distress, it's disease, it's, it's just separation. I'm going to put it on you, and I'm going to then take the wrath that I must afflict the condemnation that must follow and I'm going to put all that on you and because this has been set in the law and the law makes it clear that he cursed is the man who does not continue in every part of the law it's not a pick and choose law so if you try to keep the law we go into the curse because none of us can keep the law so it's a it's a it's a, it's a you're stuck but I'm going to put all the curse on you because it is written cursed is everyone that hangs on the tree why? Because in you becoming the curse, I will, ex I will exhaust it. In you becoming sin, I will judge it. In you uh, bearing the sickness and the diseases, I will remove them. I will do to you what all men are deserving and, are, and the future that all men face. And I'm going to do it to you, my son. And Jesus is... A aware of this because he's the word he's reading scripture he's following the lord and you know at the end at gethsemane he's saying father i don't want to do this if there's another way please let this cap cup pass but nevertheless not my will your will be done so he then becomes the sacrifice for sin he became sin who knew no sin he bore our sicknesses carried our diseases he was he was rich became poor and the father fully does the work. So the offering is accepted. It's, uh, and he calls to his son, as the, as the son calls out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And, and the whole separation that has really occurred, because it was a spiritual death that God was dealing with. Do you remember Adam? God said to Adam and Eve, the day you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will die. He didn't say a week later, a year later, or 900 years later. He said, the day you eat. And they, yes, they did die because their eyes were open. The glory left. They saw their nakedness. They became afraid and ashamed. And they began to hide and lie and pass blame immediately because they died. Their, the light, of, light went off. And it took 900 plus years for his physical body to die, which was the effect of the death. But it wasn't the, the immediate thing. It was a spiritual death. So Jesus on the cross is dying, has died spiritually. He's fallen into the abyss. He has had all of that placed upon him. And the Father looks because he is now not... He's completed the execution, the judge and executioner. Now he returns as Father because now 
the, the, pun, the penalty has been paid. And he says, I call you my son. Today I'm your father. And Jesus is born again. The man is, is recreated. The last Adam. The second Adam. The last Adam becomes a life-giving spirit. Not a living soul that he lived under the father. It's a new, new creation to which we're all now being transformed and conformed into that same image from glory to glory. And Jesus says these words, and I believe firmly, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Because Jesus knew he'd already now walked through what, what the, 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 the darkness and separation of death that we all so often live with, but we are not aware that it's what's cr trying to, to suck our life out. But now he's facing physical death, and he says, I commit my, my spirit to your father. And he dies. Three days later, he's raised from the dead. I read, we read to this week in Matthew. I love it. I love it because Matthew even made it clear. It says, the angel came and rolled the stone away, freaked the guards out. They fell like dead. The ladies saw the angel, and then the angel says, why are you, uh, he's not, why are you here? He's not here. He's not here. Come see where he lay. And you have to realize this Jesus did not need an angel to roll the stone away to get out of the grave. He had already left. He got a new body, the one we're going to get. He goes through, goes through anything. He appears, disappears. He, he's a, this is something that's just really radically happened. And Forty days later, he's ascended. And having ascended, he goes up to Mount Zion. Mount Zion is a natural Mount Zion in Jerusalem. It's a beautiful place to visit. But there is a Mount Zion that's a heavenly Mount Zion. Hebrews 12 makes that very clear, that we did not come to the mountain that was burning with fire where Moses was so overwhelmed with and afraid and, and frightened by the terror of it, but we've come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the new company. So Jesus ascends like Moses ascended into the glory, but he does not descend. He sits down. I'm telling a story, but it's all in the Bible, right? He sits down. Because God the Father who said, you are my son today, I've begotten you. Now, in Psalm 110, which is all in Acts chapter 2, he says to G David, said, the Lord said, uh, sit to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Jehovah said to Adonai, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So Jesus is, is now begun his ministry. His ministry of submission and, and trust and going about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil was, was secondary to the primary, which the primary was to become a perfect living sacrifice and to then, by, by doing so, undoing death and through death, destroying him who had power of death. And so he, everything's changed and he's ascended and he's sitting down. Hebrews gives us a beautiful picture of what happened, I believe, in those 10 days prior to the 50th day, the day of Pentecost. He takes his blood to the heavenly tabernacle. When Moses was told to make a tabernacle, God said to him, make it according to the pattern of what I'm showing you here in the glory. And so the tabernacle that Moses made was patterned after the tabernacle that's in heaven. And Revelation tells us very clearly there's a tabernacle in heaven. There's a temple. There's, a, there's the, the... And so now Jesus is not just, not just dealing with the sin of humanity against humanity or even the sin of humanity against God. He's now making a way for those who have faith in his resurrection to come and sit with him in heavenly places. Today, in real time. You understand why depression attacks the body of Jesus Christ? Because if we were to step into the place that we're called to step into, we would quickly start to see the subduing of many enemies. But we, we, we get sucked back into the soul. See, we are all born living souls. 
but we're being regenerated into life-giving spirits. It's a, cha it's a process. 1 Corinthians 15, just buried a dear sister and shared that whole testimony to 100 plus uh, friends and families, Juanita. And I'm saying, you know, here's the deal. We bear the, we bear, we, we, we will have the first Adam's image, the men of dust. We're part of the earth. We're made of the dust. We feel and we see and we, but now we're going to come into this life-giving spirit that, that we're going to bear his image and, and death's going to get swallowed up and, and in victory. And we don't have, and, and the sting of death, which is sin, is going to be swallowed up because the, st the strength of sin is the law. And we're in a whole nother new covenant. So while Jesus is, now, uh, making heaven accessible through his blood, he is given by an oath, God the Father places Jesus, resurrected Son of God. You're my Son. You're not the only begotten Son, John 1. You are the firstborn among many brethren, Son. Different. And he says, I swear to you, as an oath, when God uses an oath, he sevens himself. He places himself in something to which nothing can alter what he has determined and nothing can dis dissuade him from what he said. He made an oath to Abraham. He said, Abraham, because you've done this thing, offered your son as a sacrifice with faith that I would raise him from the dead, because you've done this thing with Isaac, I now say, I will through your seed possess the gates of your enemy. Not seeds of plural, but seed as one, Jesus Christ. He said to David by an oath, I will bring of your natural seed, your natural lineage, I will bring the Messiah. And he now says to Jesus, the resurrected man, there's a mediator next to God called the man, Christ Jesus. But he's not just a man. It's not just an event. It's not just something that took place and no longer, you know, really has a lot of effect. It's the rule of the universe, of the kingdom. This Jesus is called King of Righteousness, Melchizedek, King of Peace. And beyond that declaration, he, has set, he is coronated. He is made king and priest. And, and again, Zechariah prophesies this. Uh, it's that he would, he, would, he would bear both royal priesthood and, and a priestly king. He would, the government would rest on him, and between the two there would be peace. He's now seated at the right hand. Not, not he is, he's king of peace, Melchizedek. And because he's the king of the peace, he now has the capacity, as it says in Hebrews 7, that because he has the power of an endless life, his, his priesthood doesn't dissipate. It doesn't disappear because he's never going to die. Death cannot hold him. Acts chapter 2 said it's impossible. Death couldn't keep him because he had a, an endless life living in him. It was just, it was a, it was a complete prophecy, and it was to put, make a, a declaration, and it was for all of us to be going around and saying, there is a man who was raised from the dead, and he is now seated at the right hand of God as our high priest. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He is our Deliverer. And because of this, let me just take this. Take, just Acts chapter 2. I have just abbreviated can't read the whole chapter, but Acts chapter 2, when they're giving uh, focus. I'm not diminishing Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm giving him something to work with. Because he came because Jesus raised from the dead and seated at the right hand of God the Father because he had, his, his blood has been accepted, and now he was high priest. And he says, he, because he's a high priest, he's ever living to make intercession. If I come to God through him, he's coming. He's saying, Father, they're coming through me. And if we need to make any adjustment on Steve's thinking, feelings, emotions, decisions, I'll take care of it. That's my job now. I'm the intercessor. We, he may have it not right, but it doesn't matter because he's coming through me. He's using my name. The blood, my blood's giving him the boldness. He's pros, he's, and, and what happens is uh, you, the relationship starts maturing. Your father is always your father. Jesus is always your savior. His blood is always the, what gives us 
our acceptance. Yes, we can walk away. We can wander away. We can say, I don't really care. I don't think God's done anything that wonderful for me. I'm not even sure if I still believe. We can do all of that, and the effects will follow. But it does not change if we but for one moment realize, you know, in my father's house, it was a lot better. And I don't think being mad at God is helping me much. And I think I'm going to just repent and call upon his name and say, Lord, I just... I've been stubborn, I've been willful, I've been disobedient, I've been trying to rewrite your, your rules, and I'm just submitting. But I'm not going to have to fix it and make it right and, and earn your trust. I'm accepted in the beloved. I'm appropriating the Christ. I, I'm, I'm, and that's what this life is all about now, is appropriating the gift of life in the Son. And so in Acts chapter Two. He says in verse 31, quoting David. See, the Holy Spirit came because Christ was exalted. Without the exaltation of Christ, there's no Holy Spirit coming in the manner in which he could come inside us, abide upon us, empower us, and, t- and bring the new covenant. See, we said the law has been done. The letter of the law kills and it condemns, because the sooner we try to be what we said we would be, that the law told us we are to be, we will find, if we're honest, failures. And if not, we'll be hypocrites. We'll learn how to act it one way and live it another way. But neither way will we be accepted through the law. We will be aware of the, 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 that it was not, it, the law's perfect. Not committing adultery is is God. Not stealing is God. Not lying is God. Resting in after our labor is God. We're not talking about change. God's never changed. He's just had to find another means to bring us into his likeness, which is through his son. He had to pay for the price. And then now, in 2 Corinthians 3, just give me a moment. Second, keep your thinking going. I know the tacos are ready. They're getting ready. But think, just, just listen to me. Because this is important. Because I watch most believers go like this. And I go like this every day too. But I'm learning to return to truth. And agree with truth. And fellowship with the truth. And submit to the truth. Then, then though I might not... My emotions will catch up. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. But I, I'm, I'm a little strength. I don't deny his name. And I try to keep his word the best I can by saying it's true and it's valuable and I love you. So this Jesus accomplished through submission. I've told you this. He did not do anything. He submitted to death. That through death, he could destroy him who had the power of death that through what he submitted to the Father to because he, somebody had to take the rap. Someone had to pay the price. Someone had to come under, and he accepted the Father's call to be that one. The Messiah had to be a suffering servant before he could be a, a victorious, conquering king. But now he is the victorious, conquering king, and it's just magnificent. But so this, uh, verse 31, Acts chapter 2, So David, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ. It's in the resurrection that this new ministry, this high priestly ministry, this this call forth as Messiah. I mean, in essence, he's always been who he always is. But he's functional. And I believe that's been the plan of hell to keep us ignorant of his functionality so we're not taking advantage of it. Just think about it. If he is my high priest, and if I come to God through him, and he then says, I'm engaged for perpetual time to intercede for you. Now, intercede does not mean he's sitting there going, oh, Dad, please, please, we've got to, please. No, that's not, that's, that's not intercession. Intercession is chancing upon. It's meeting someone. It's bringing someone back into truth. It's, it's, it's bringing my mind out of my confusion back into truth and submission and peace. 
It's bringing me out of anxiety back into peace. Why does it say, don't be anxious for anything, but in, within everything, with prayer, supplication, and giving of thanks, that your request be made known to God? And then, then to tell us that, that, that this is a, a functional promise, he says, and the peace of God will pass us all understanding, and will guard your heart and your mind. So the first sign of answered prayer is peace. <laughs> and joy. So the kingdom now is being brought from within and taking possession on the outside. We're not trying to outside look perfect. We're trying to submit to the perfect one outside and accept the work that he's accomplished and let it begin to bubble up inside. And it really is insightable. It's just imaginal. So he says to this, he said, foreseeing the resurrection of Christ, the soul was not left in Hades, and the flesh did not see corruption. This Jesus, this Jesus, God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses, the witnesses of the resurrection, not of the, of the life he lived, although that is obviously a part of the life that we are to witness and to, and to fellowship with him in the Gospels, but this resurrection, therefore being exalted, therefore, reason being, exalted to the right hand of God. See, this is why we, we've just not, we're just scratching the surface of what could be experienced. And, 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 and taken uh, into partnership with why we are called kings and priests on earth to reign with him. So he's now been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, the coronation. Psalm 2 says, though nations are raging, people are plotting vain things, kings of the earth setting themselves, rulers are taking counsel to throw away the cords and rule of God over their lives. Ha, 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 he laughs. And then it says he will speak and wrath, derision, and then it says, yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Mount Zion. Literally, I have poured myself into my king, Melchi. When I call you forth, my king of righteousness, when what has been accomplished is fulfilled, and where you have been brought up to is now been given to you. And Hebrews says, Jesus didn't come in there and say, I'm the high priest now. I've taken the job. He was given the position by the Father in an oath. You are my high priest. I swear I will not relent. I will not return. I will not change my mind. Forever a high priest. Now Jesus steps in and how he receives the Holy Spirit. And then he pours him out on everybody. And because he does this, well, it goes on. He says, David did not ascend into heavens and having received... He says of himself, the Lord said to my Lord, verse 34, please, sit at my right hand. I am finding if I will, if I will, if I will honor the Son as the Lord, as God the Father describes him in the Scripture and experiencing him in the truth of his exalted, resurrected state at the right hand of God the Father, all the benefits that have been accomplished start flooding into my life. And I don't have to be the one trying to uh, work out this, the problem I'm in because the problem I'm in is temporary. And the glory that God has given me is eternal. And if I keep my eyes on the unseen, then that what's seen will soon dissipate anyway. So he goes on, he says, the Lord said, sit at my right hand. That's the promise. That's the prophecy in Psalm 110. Till I make your enemies your footstool. That's what we're in the process of, of, of watching God begin to set in motion. And it starts with me. It starts with my life, my little kingdom, my emotions, my soul, my way in which I resolve conflicts. What do I do? How do I? It's submission. I have to be the first one submitted. Otherwise, I have no authority to bring submission and life to anyone else. And I, I can't operate in the wrath because wrath is not work the righteousness. So I'm, I'm the one coming in. Yes, I receive everything. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, the resurrected, glorified, exalted Son, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. 
both Lord and Messiah. And so all of all that was understood Messiah would do for Israel is now effectively available to all of Israel. And fortunately, ten chapters to eight chapters later, we get included, the Gentiles, to come into this to the believing Israel. And he's Lord in Christ. And so these devout, these are devout Jews. They are there for the feast. They came prescribed to appear at the place where the temple was, and they've heard a sound that came from heaven. It's now being noised abroad. It's occurring. It's affecting. And now it's a, instead of, oh, the Holy Spirit, they go, yes, whoa, the Holy Spirit. But he's here because of the exalted Christ. Behold the exalted Christ. Exalt, see the exalted Christ. And so now they're getting it. So he said, what do we do? They were cut to the heart. They said, what do we do? I'm sorry, I'm paraphrasing, so it's hard to keep up with me. Uh, Verse 37. So now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And said, Peter and the rest of the apostles, man, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter says, the simplest truth that never is left, it's never changed. It's the way in and it's the way we stay in. Repent. Which means accept these new thoughts. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus, which is the fact of conversion. Turn to these thoughts and accept them to be true for the remission of your sin, because you're not to live in the guilt, guilt-fueled life. You're not to live with remorse, regret. Everything you went through is so you could find Jesus. Everything you go through is for finding Jesus. Everything that happened to you is to find Jesus. The only thing that is important in life is that I find Jesus. And I find him in the situation. And if I do, then whatever I went through is perfect. And then my enemies become my friends because you, you tried to destroy my life. But God, in the, your destruction, I found Jesus. Do you, do you understand? It, makes, it just dismantles victimization. It has to because you, 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 you never, never can look at life as... Oh, if only this wouldn't have happened, I would be in a better place. And if this wouldn't have happened, I could have been. No, no, you, you just, we did it to ourselves, And God did it to us if we didn't do it. Because he was committed to having many sons. Many sons that are, that are in new covenant. So you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promises to us, the children, and everyone else. One last thought, and then we got to, I just, I I promise I will pray, but you're doing good. I can feel you're listening. And if you meditate this, if you'll take this, it's all, it's the Bible. It's just, it's just, there's layers of this all over. But 2 Corinthians 3 tells us this, that the first covenant was a letter of the law that kills and brings condemnation. The second covenant, the new covenant, is the covenant of the spirit, not the letter of the law, but the spirit. And the Spirit gives life and righteousness. Now, if you said, well, how in the world does that happen? And you can just jot this down. Jeremiah 31 is when it was prophesied. Hebrews 8, Hebrews 10 is when it's, when it's validated by the author to say this is indeed what was prophesied. And that is that I will make a new covenant. I will put my laws in your mind and I'll write them in your heart. You still got the same laws. But instead, it's a different delivery system. It's through the Spirit. And the Spirit says, don't worry about your flesh. It's funky. Follow me. Spend time with me. I'm full of fruit and not fruity. I'm full of love and joy and peace. I am the kingdom. You want to know where the kingdom of God is? It's in you. And I am the kingdom. And it's righteousness, peace, and joy. Now, It's tested by the circumstances in conflict to the truth. And the truth will prevail. If I am sick and God's spirit witnesses in the scripture that by his stripes I was healed and he bore my sickness and carried my disease and I then declare in my heart I'm going to accept these truths and I'm going to anticipate the manifestation of this and I'm going to have an expectancy. And I stay sick and and I die, I'm in a better position than had I said, oh God, why don't you heal me? Somebody's got to pray for me. Somewhere there's going to be a healing. And unless I get healed, I'm not healed. 
No, you're healed. You're saved. You're delivered. You're free. As soon as truth comes. You see, we're learning to live by the Spirit. So, new covenant, and I want to pray for it, because God, Papa said, I want a party in my hearts of my people. I want to give a party in my hearts of my people. What Jesus accomplished by submission, now what he is accomplishing through intercession is huge. He's your best friend. He says, I will put my laws in your mind, I'll write them in your heart, and I'll be your God. And nobody will have to go around teaching each other, know the Lord, know the Lord, know the Lord. This is what it means to know the Lord. This is what, if you don't do it this way, you don't know the Lord. No more. For all will know me, from the least to the greatest. Why? Because I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sin and lawless deeds I will remember no more. I will forgive and forget. When we call upon the name of the Lord, we are saved. When we are calling upon the name of the Lord in a set of circumstances, we are saved. When we call upon the name of the Lord in a set of conflict and sin that we found ourselves in, we are saved. And when we are saved, we are given salvation without a regret. We can encounter the Lord freely, fully, now, again, as though I had never sinned because I'm back in the justification. So the power of this new covenant it's wonderful because we can't, we can't, we can't get caught. We, we, we have access continually. Access continually. We can stay fresh. And, and, and when the Lord showed me, the way I know you is by forgiving you. And that's how you'll know everybody else. And the closest we'll ever get to that is in a marriage. Because the way you learn somebody and love somebody is forgiving them. Not because they deserve to be loved because you recognize that in the covenant, I want to release you because I don't want to demand of you what I don't even think I can give. Or, you know, you just come to this, I love, I forgive. Well, God's done that with all of us. Whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever happened to you, whatever you've done, whatever someone did to you, God has resolved it for eternity in the Son. And you and I can just say, I accept the testimony of God. He has given me eternity eternal life, and this life is in the Son. And so I come to you, Father, through the Son. I accept that Father, the Son is appearing over me in your presence for me. I receive life. I receive healing. I receive deliverance. Let's stand together. I, I, there's nothing in the Bible that we can't have in the Son. Beloved, I praise you. Lord, help me. Holy Spirit, you're the one that comes to help us bear these thoughts and truths and to begin to engage in them or get just a little piece of something that we can follow you further into the Scripture. Holy Spirit, we are welcoming. It was because you came, because Jesus was exalted, because death had been destroyed, because a new covenant had been cut, and enacted that it could be now given in such a powerful way. Oh. Where are you struggling today? I might ask, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Sometimes we don't even aren't aware that there is a second baptism. The new birth comes with the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit comes with a power, infilling, a speaking in other tongues. Maybe you haven't even received that. We can give that to everybody today. Because it's in Jesus. But I feel the strength of the Lord right now. It says, I am here to destroy regret and sorrow and sighing and a sense of of despair and hopelessness. I'm here to put a song back in the heart of my people. The, the, no longer sorrow and sighing, but rejoicing, singing, and celebrating. Would you like that? I mean, no more pining away and loss, no 
You, there is an unlimited joy in Christ and peace. And yes, we've done wrong. And yes, people have done us wrong. And yes, we can demand that those who did us wrong make it right. But we may spend the rest of our life stuck there. Or we can just start forgiving everyone and be forgiven by God and let life start brand new every day, every day. The same joy that came at the day I said yes to Jesus still comes to me. The same peace still comes. So I'll lift up our hands. Lord, whoa. Tell him what you would love for him to lift out for your life or obliterate in your psyche, your soul, your emotions, your circumstance, situation. Tell him where captivity has held you, where you'd like to get out of. You don't know how to get out of it, but you want it out. Tell him where you'd love to live in the fullness of forgiveness instead of thinking it's always still there and enter into God's forgetfulness of forgiveness. The more you can say, I want to be healed. I want to be helped. I don't want to live just in the level I'm on. I want to come into what you called me to be. Whatever you can say, it's just, it's articulation. Okay, together now. Let's make a confession. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus Christ, for exalting him to your right hand that he became my sin and was judged for my sin and condemned for my sin and was cursed for my sin and was raised for my justification and exalted to be my high priest at your right hand. I receive this resurrection I believe I confess you Jesus my Lord fill me now Jesus with the Holy Spirit and speak with other tongues fill me with joy Holy Spirit fill me with peace Holy Spirit fill me with love fill me with boldness Yes, yes, yes. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Go ahead, just raise your hand. Receive, receive. We're receiving. We're receiving. We are. Go ahead and you can speak in other tongues. Just honor the Lord for a moment with the gift he's given us. All of you at home, receive, receive, receive. Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive. Receive. He's taken off regret, re remorse. He's taken off discouragement, hopelessness, and despair. He's obliterating depression. He's coming in a fullness of his largeness. Holy Spirit is celebrating the kingdom of God within us. Oh, shera mala 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 mala. He's taking sickness out of our bodies. He can do it all. He's doing it. Now there's there's much more, but we've got lunch ahead. We've got a big day. And I want to release a blessing for the food and for us to go out and begin to enjoy and celebrate and give you a permission to wait for a few minutes. There's, do not take the line to tacos and just stay in the presence. Because there's more. There's more. Lord God, I thank you. What an honor it is to be able to, every day, seek to encounter you in your exalted state. And what a gift it is to have the Holy Spirit ready to empower, to lead, to re delight and rejoice. Lord, I ask you, as we go out in the parking lot and we have a party, we do thank you that we're a body. And what's coming is going to be an activated living body, every member doing its part, coming into the fullness of the edification of love. It's going to be glorious. 
We look to the Wednesdays coming and the Sundays coming and the activation. And every member, there's one head and the rest of us are the members of the body. And we bless you. And we say, make, we, we just, we place ourselves right before you. And you can do anything and everything you said you wanted to do that you gave us in Christ before time began. We say, why not? Let it happen now. We're never too old. We're never too young. So right now, just if you lift up your hands, I believe if you could just imagine God, it's not an intelligent thing. It's, a, it's, a, it's an image. He puts a scroll in your hand. He says, this is your inheritance, son, daughter. It's in Christ. Don't worry about reading it. It's in Christ. But you're not forgotten. You've never been forsaken. And there's so much more to be done. You've never even completed where I've brought you to be. But it's here. Irreversible, incorruptible, undefiled, does not fade away. It's yours, son, daughter. Receive it. And if we just take it, it's like the prophet Ezekiel's told, put it into your heart. Eat it. And let it go into your heart. In Jesus' name, we receive our inheritance in Christ for eternity. Now, kept by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.